Now that we've taken a look at parametric curves and how to work with uh, parametrized equations, we're ready to take that up to the level of calculus and ask ourselves the question, how do we do calculus with parametric equations? And really, calculus is very similar in parametric as it is in rectangular coordinates. But there are a few adjustments that we're going to make. First, we're going to take a look at derivatives with parametric equations. And the big thing with derivatives is normally when we find a derivative, we call it dy dx. Well dy and dx are now separate equations. So we have to take their derivatives separately. So we'll take the derivative of the y equation with respect to t and divide it by the derivative of the x equation with respect to t. In other words, we're taking y prime of t divided by x prime of t to get dy dt. So some examples of doing this. would include if x of t is equal to t squared minus 3 and y of t equals 2t minus 1. So if we want to find the derivative of this, the derivative is dy over dx. So first, we need to find dy. Well, y prime, the derivative of the y function with respect to t, we know is 2 over the derivative of x with respect to t. Well, x prime of t is equal to 2t. So our denominator is 2t. And when we simplify by reducing out the 2s, we get the derivative dy dx being 1 over t. And this becomes the function of the slope of the tangent line at any point on this parametric curve with respect to t. Let's do one more example. Let's try x of t equals 5 cosine squared of t. And y of t is equal to 5 sine squared of t. Well, again, we need the individual derivatives. First, we need y's derivative, which we know is 5 times, bring the 2 out front, sine of t, times the derivative of the sine, which is the cosine of t, using the chain rule there. So really, that's 10 sine cosine. And now the derivative of x with respect to t is we have the 5 times, bring the 2 out front, 2 cosine of t, times the derivative of the inside, which is negative sine of t. And so if we clean that up, we get negative 10 cosine t sine t. And so when we want to find the derivative, which is dy dx, we simply plug those in. The derivative of y was 10 sine t cosine t over the derivative of x with respect to t, which was negative 10 cosine t sine t. And this time, we get a lot of reducing that happens, leaving just the negative in the denominator. Really, we have 1 over negative 1, which is just negative 1 which means the slope of this function is negative 1. Now, when we were back in calculus 1, we didn't just want to find the derivatives, because the derivative was the slope of the tangent line. But we actually wanted to find that tangent line quite often through a given point. So let's see if we can do that as well. Let's find the tangent line which you remember is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. 
where m is equal to the slope dy dx at the point x1 comma y1. So if we have the function x of t is equal to t squared minus 4t, and y of t equals 2t cubed minus 6t, and we want the equation of the tangent line at the point t equals 5, we can build this in much the same way. First, we're going to find the slope y prime of t is equal to 6t squared minus 6. And x prime at t is equal to 2t minus 4. And then the derivative dy over dx is equal to the y, 6t squared minus 6 over the x, 2t minus 4. And this represents the slope of the tangent line to any point. We're specifically interested in the slope at t equals 5. So if we plug 5 into that, we have 6 times 5 squared minus 6 over 2 times 5 minus 4. 6 times 25 minus 6 is 144 over 6. And dividing, we get exactly 24. Now we've got the slope of our tangent line. We still need to go back and find what point that is actually the slope at. So if we go back to our x of t equation, and find out what's happening at x of 5, we'll have 5 squared minus 5 times 4, or 4 times 5, same thing, which is 25 minus 20, which is 5. And y at that point of 5 is 2 times 5 cubed minus 6 times 5 which is 125 times 2 is 250 minus 30 is 220. So we also have this point then of 5 comma 220. Now we have a point and we have a slope. We're ready to make the equation of our tangent line, which is y minus the y coordinate of 220 equals the slope of 24 times x minus the x coordinate of 5. And we now have the equation of the tangent line through this curve when time is equal to 5. Let's do one more example. Let's say x of t is equal to the sine of t, and y of t is equal to the cosine of t. And we want the tangent line at t equals pi over 3. Well, the derivative of y with respect to time is negative sine of t. And the derivative of x with respect to t is cosine of t. So our derivative dy dx is equal to the negative sine of t over the cosine of t, which we should recognize sine over cosine is tangent. So we get the negative tangent of t. And we want to know specifically what happens with that slope at t equals pi over 3. So what we're really working on is t negative tangent of pi over 3. And the tangent of pi over 3 is the square root of 3. So we have negative square root of 3 is the slope of our tangent line at pi over 3. Now we just need our point. If we plug pi over 3 into the x equation, careful, not the derivative in the equation, 
x is equal to sine of t. So we have the sine of pi over 3. And the sine of pi over 3 is 1 half. Plugging pi over 3 into the y function, y is going to be cosine of pi over 3, which is root 3 over 2, which gives us the point 1 half comma root 3 over 2 to go with our slope of negative root 3 and make our tangent line, which is y minus 1 half, the y coordinate, equals the slope, negative square root of 3, times x minus the x coordinate, square root of 3 over 2. And we found the equation of our tangent line. So it's kind of a brief overview of doing derivatives with parametric equations. We can also do antiderivatives with parametric equations. And they just need a little bit of a tweak to what we've done before. So let's take a look at the antiderivatives. These would be our integrals. And remember, with antiderivatives or integrals, the fundamental theorem of calculus told us what we're really finding is the area under a curve. And it turns out that if we want to find the area under a curve in parametric equations, we still take the integral from a to b. But we need to account for the fact that our dx's is split up into an x function and a y function with respect to t. So we've got the y function that we're going to integrate with. But when we use the chain rule with the dx, we end up with an x prime of t dt. Also, it's important to note that a is the left endpoint. Because sometimes with parametric equations, the graph ends up being graphed from right to left, in which case we need to switch the order of the integration or just take the opposite of the final integral. We'll take a look at what that means when it comes up. But for now, we'll say if we want the area under the curve, we take the antiderivative from a to b, the integral from a to b of the y function times the derivative of the x function dt. Here's an example of what that looks like. If x of t is equal to 2 cosine of t plus the cosine of 2t, and y of t is equal to 2 sine of t minus the sine of 2t, we're going to find the area under the curve between 0 and pi. Well, the first thing we need to know if we're going to use this function, this operation to find the area under the curve, is we need to know the derivative of the x function. So first, the x derivative. Uh, the antiderivative of 2 cosine is negative 2 sine t. And the antiderivative of cosine of 2t using the chain rule is negative 2 sine of 2t. So when we plug that into our integral function, the area under the curve from 0 to pi of the y function, which is 2 sine t minus the sine of 2t, times the derivative of the x function, which is negative 2 sine t minus 2 sine of 2t dt. And then all we have to do is evaluate that integral to find the area under that curve. This integral is going to take a little bit of work to work out. So let's give ourselves a little bit more space to work with. And let's see what happens. 
First thing I'd notice is that I've got a GCF of negative 2 inside this last factor. I can factor out that negative 2 and pull it all the way out of the integral. So let's do that. Negative 2 times the integral from 0 to pi of 2 sine t minus the sine of 2t times, now it's positive sine t plus the sine of 2t dt. And then to keep integrating, let's take, let's foil this out. Yeah. Let's foil this all out. So we've got 2 sine squared of t plus 2 sine of t times the sine of 2t minus the sine of t times the sine of 2t minus the sine squared of 2t dt. Now let's go ahead and combine the like terms in the middle. So we have negative 2 times the integral from 0 to pi of 2 sine squared of t plus sine of t sine of 2t minus the sine squared of 2t dt. A couple things that I notice here. Um, we each piece of this integral, we need to do some work with using some trig formulas in order to simplify. We see the sine squared of t. And we remember that the sine squared of t is equal to 1 half times, or minus 1 half times the cosine of double the angle, 2t. So we're going to replace that sine squared with this property. And what's nice when that 2 distributes through, it's going to clear out those 1 halves. So we end up with negative 2 times the integral from 0 to pi. When the 2 distributes through, we have 1 minus the cosine of 2t plus another thing I notice is we've got a sine of 2t. We have a, a formula from trig that says the sine of 2t is equal to 2 sine of t cosine of t. And when we multiply that by the sine, we'll end up with 2 sine squared of t times the cosine of t. And that's set up now for a nice, easy substitution, where u is sine and du is cosine minus. And again, we see the sine squared. So we'll use the sine squared formula again to say 1 half plus, because we have to distribute the negative through, 1 half cosine. And when we double the angle, we get 4t dt. Let's go ahead and combine. There's not much for like terms, but we do have 1 minus 1 half. So now we have negative 2 times the integral from 0 to pi of 1 half minus the cosine of 2t plus 2 sine squared t cosine t plus 1 half cosine of 4t dt. And after all that algebra, we finally have something we can integrate. We have negative 2 times 1 half of t minus the antiderivative of cosine is sine of 2t. But we need a 1 half to take care of the 2 on the inside. Plus, sine squared comes from a sine cubed. But we need to divide by 3 to take care of that. And then using the chain rule gives us the cosine. You can check that using substitution. Plus, antiderivative of cosine is sine of 4t. But we need to divide by a 4, which means we have a total of divide by 1 8th. And we're integrating this whole thing from 0 to pi. What's nice is when we plug pi into sine, pi or 0, both pi and 0 of sine go to 0, which means all the terms go away except for the very first one. So we end up with negative 2 times 1 half of pi minus 0, 
because when we plug in half a zero is zero. And then when we multiply this together, negative two times pi over two is negative pi. But wait, why is it negative? We made a small error at the beginning in that we didn't take the time to notice if a was a left endpoint or a right endpoint. If we start integrating at 0, we're claiming that 0 is the left endpoint. Let's take a look at this graph really quick. What I've done here is I've asked Desimos to graph this parametric curve for us as t grows from 0 to some value a. And a is going to be a video that's going to scroll from 0 up to pi. And I want to notice when this graph is drawn, it's going to start here at 3, 0. And as a gets bigger, it goes off to the left. This curve is actually drawn backwards until our time is equal to pi. And this then becomes the curve that we're trying to find the area underneath down to the x-axis. But because it was drawn from right to left, the leftmost endpoint was actually pi, not 0, which means we should have integrated not from 0 to pi, but from pi to 0 to make it integrate from left to right. That way, our dt is positive. Well, we could fix that easily at the end, because if we switch the order of integration, that would have stuck a negative out front. Well, let's just make that adjustment at the end and say this is drawn backwards, which means the area under the curve is actually equal to a positive pi. So if it's drawn backwards, you'll end up with a negative area. And that should be your hint, oh, this is probably drawn from right to left. We need to take the absolute value and say it's equal to the positive value, because area can never be negative. I want to take a look at one more use of integration of calculus with parametric curves. We've talked about the area under a curve, but let's actually talk about another interesting thing. And that is, I think this is number two, arc length. Arc length was generally one of the most difficult formulas to work with in rectangular coordinates. And there are some situations where arc length is actually easier to work with in parametric equations. We just need a slightly different formula to account for the fact that we have an x and a y function. To find the arc length, it's going to be the integral from a to b of the square root of, and instead of 1 plus the derivative squared, it's going to be dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. It really comes from the Pythagorean theorem, the change in the x plus the change in the y squared dt. One thing we need to be careful of as we use this formula, and it's a property from pre-calculus that we don't spend a lot of time on, but it does become important here, is when we take the square root of something that's been squared, it's not actually equal to that something. It's actually equal to the absolute value of that something. And so sometimes if you get a weird answer, we might need to go back and say, let's take the absolute value of what was under the square root instead of what, was, what we ended up with. It doesn't become an issue often, but when, it, when you get a weird answer like an arc length of 0, uh, something like that, that's probably what happened. All right, let's try an example. Let's say x of t is equal to 3t squared, and y of t is equal to 2t cubed. And we're going to find the arc length as t runs from 1 to 3. Well, to use the formula, we need to take both derivatives and square them. So let's take the derivative of x, which is 6t. And when we square the derivative of x, we get 36t squared. With the y's, the derivative of y is 6t squared. And when we take that derivative and square it, 
we'll get 36t to the fourth. So using our formula, we're going to take the integral as t runs from 1 to 3 of the square root of the x derivative squared, which was 36t squared, plus the y derivative squared, which is 36t to the fourth dt. And if we can integrate this guy, we'll end up with our arc length from 1 to 3. Let's do a little simplifying with this. We've got a common factor of 36t squared that can come out. That's going to leave behind 1 plus t squared dt. And we can take the square root of 36t squared. It's 6t times the square root of 1 plus t squared dt. And we're set up then for a nice substitution where u is equal to 1 plus t squared du is equal to 2t dt. Well, to get that 6 to be a 2, we're going to divide it by 3. So we'll divide by 3 inside and multiply by 3 outside. So we end up with 3 times the integral. Make sure we plug our limits of integration into the u. 1 plus 1 squared is 2. 1 plus 3 squared is 10. And we're left with just the square root of u, or u to the 1 half du, which is equal to 3 times u to the 3 halves times the reciprocal, which is 2 thirds, integrated from 2 to 10. The 3's divide out, and so we're just left with 2 times u, which we'll start by plugging in 10 to the 3 halves, minus, plug the 2 in, 2 to the 3 halves. And that's not going to be any pretty numbers, so let's just leave our arc length as that value, 2 times 10 to the 3 halves minus 2 to the 3 halves. And that's how we can find arc length in parametric curves. So we've taken a look at both derivatives and antiderivatives, specifically in the context of tangent lines and arc lengths and area under curves. Take a look at the homework assignment to practice a few of these. And we will talk about them more in class. See you then.